Hi, I'm Dan. I'm a principal engineer at Skyscanner. And in this talk, I want to talk about open telemetry and how we can help you deliver effective observability and also help you do it efficiently within your organization. But before we before I introduce myself, I want to start by discussing one of the key questions that observability helps to answer. And that is when our systems change, which could be because we deployed a new version of a component or because our users are using it in a completely different way. How do we know what changed? Because our systems are a bit like black boxes, we send a request in and we get a response out. But we have little information of what goes on inside the system to be able to serve that response. And this is this is why we uh, we produce telemetry in the form of metrics, of traces and logs that gives us more information about what goes on inside a system in production. Now, it's really easy to see how a change that we make to a script that we are debugging locally uh, has the desired effect or not. We, we've all done this. We've all added print statements here and there. And, uh, and in a way, in a very primitive way, that is some form of observability because it does tell us something about the script execution. And when we change it, we expect to see something, hopefully something, something different being printed. Now, I think we would all agree that this doesn't really scale. Uh, these print statements are not really going to get us very far because our, script, our, our systems are not simple scripts that we debug locally. Our systems are complex distributed systems with hundreds of services deployed and, and thousands of interconnections between them. So this, what you see here, is a representation of the service mesh, a Skyscanner, and the service dependencies between them. So when we deploy a change to one of these services, how do we know that change didn't affect anything else apart from our service? How do we know it didn't affect its dependencies upstream or, or downstream dependencies? And most importantly, when something fails, how do we get to the root cause of that regression fast? Because we can't keep um, thinking about our services as if they were running in isolation when they're running in a complex distributed system. For that, we need observability. And in this talk, I'm, um, I would like to tell you how open telemetry and open standards can help you achieve effective observability within your systems to be able to debug those regressions faster. Now, a bit... A little bit about me first. I joined uh, Skyscanner in 2018, originally to work on performance and resource optimization. But since 2020, I've been leading a really exciting project to rely on open standards and open telemetry for the instrumentation of our, um, uh, for telemetry instrumentation, and, uh, and to improve the observability of our systems to allow us to detect and debug incidents faster in production. For the last 12 years, I spent uh, my time working as a platform engineer in organizations from five, from as small as five employees and bigger than 2,500 employees, always working in to reduce the cognitive loads and the toil that it takes for, um, for teams to operate their services in production. And uh, in the last few months, I've written a book called Practical Open Telemetry that discusses some of the topics that we'll be talking about today. Also, as you can see on the left, I relax by beating drums of different shapes and forms and hopefully in something that resembles a, a rhythmic pattern. But I didn't come here to talk about that today. We will cover today why observability is important without the incident um, response lifecycle. We'll cover how open standards can help to deliver that effective observability, how to roll out open telemetry efficiently within your organization, and also how to make sure that telemetry signals remain valuable and are used within your organization as they should be. So we've seen that observability helps answer that question of what changed, and that's important in many occasions, 
but especially when something goes wrong, right? When, when we apply a change and it didn't go according to plan. So what you see here are some of the key metrics during the um, um, incident response like cycle. Hopefully we are familiar with some of them, like mean time to detect or mean time to recovery. What I tried to add here as well is mean time to resolution as a metric that includes the time that it takes for us to be able to deploy a change and to make sure that we that, that change fixes the original regression. Observability helps uh, in two different ways here. The first one is to answer the question, is my system behaving as suspected? And, uh, and that involves one, the time that it takes to detect an incident and then hopefully fire an automated alert. And then to reduce the time that it takes to verify that a fix that we deployed to production has the desired effect and to do that with, with evidence. Now in the last decade, the way that we instrument .services has changed and is now easier than ever Within, with open source tooling, it's easier than ever to produce metrics and to integrate those metrics into dashboards and alerts to really um, measure what's important to our users, what's important to our customers, and be able to react to regressions of those key performance indicators as fast as possible. And this is really this is really important because that is um, when we when we deploy services hundreds of times a day, we need to be able to detect that fast so we can roll back the changes even faster. And this is, um, this is a healthy metric of, uh, of an organization. If you're able to deploy fast and recover faster, it's a, it's a metric of uh, high velocity teams within, um, within organizations. Observability also helps answer a different question, which is when an alert is fired, why is my system not behaving as suspected? So it helps us to reduce what we call the mean time to know from when the alert is fired to when the root cause is found. And even though things have changed dramatically in the other, in the other areas of observability, nothing has changed that much in how we debug our systems in production. We still treat our services as if they were running alone rather than in a within a complex distributed system. Let me give you an example. Let's put ourselves in the like service owner hat on. And we have a service here that is um, instrumented with, uh, with some metrics, some custom metrics. And, uh, and we're measuring the number of 500 responses that are returned by our service to users. Now this service has a dependency on a different service to obtain some data and then render it. In this case, when the 500 responses go, uh, the number of 500 responses go over a certain threshold, an alert fires. Now, the usual traditional incident response will um, um, basically tell our engineer on call to go and follow a particular run book. And that run book tells that engineer to go and look at a particular dashboard and to try to identify metrics that could be correlated to that increase in 500 responses. And this relies on past experience. It relies on known failure modes of the application. For example, it may be memory saturation. So the service will start to, um, to apply black, back pressure. And our engineer will try to sort of like manually correlate those or try to see if, if something moves in the, in the same direction. And they may also need to go to a login backend and ask for some particular error codes or error cases. And these are normally things that we've seen before and we can search for them. But then in these two cases, they, they both rely on past experience, right? So how do we know that there are not other metrics that could correlate to this particular, um, to this particular regression and they're not in our dashboards? Or how do we know that the error messages that we're looking for are the, the ones that are being um, emitted by the application or by the service, but a particular service replica that is um, returning those 500 response codes? Um, I mean, these error messages could also be background noise, could also be 
always there and not really be related to the root of uh, regression. And even if they are, let's say in this case, we find that, well, the service where we would get data from um, has no data to, to render. So then what do we do? Do we call another service owner? I mean, that's normally what happens. Uh, incident calls where we call a separate service owner and then they start investigating using their own RAM books and using their own dashboards. And then they may find the same conclusion that the root cost is not in their service. So this adds time to the to the incident uh, response and to that uh, time to know metric. Now let's look at the same at the same example, but relying on context rather than experience. So in this case, we can have a service that's instrumented with open telemetry and has the same metric of like number of uh, 503 responses, for example. And uh, but it's using open standards, it's using naming conventions like the name of a metric or the attributes of that particular metric. Now, an observability platform that supports these semantic conventions can assign semantics to, to that, but he knows that that's one of the golden signals. And then it can then correlate that to utilization, memory utilization metrics, for example, and automatically tell us what instance is the one that is having problems. Now, a service instrumented with open telemetry can also link to individual distributed traces using what's called exemplars, which are individual examples from within a service replica that link to the transactions that were going through that system when, for example, a high number of 500s was being recorded. So in a distributed trace, we can see that high granularity data. And we can see that from not only from my service, but on the as well from the dependency. And we can see in one go that the error seems to be within the dependency. And then OpenTelemetry can also help to correlate those using trace IDs that are part of the, in, in Java, for example, part of the, the, the thread, uh, the thread local storage, and that can be correlated using things like MDC to your legacy application logs that perhaps were not instrumented with open telemetry, but can still be correlated to that particular trace. So we know that that transaction that went through the system, we get to see the logs not only from our service, but also from other services within that same transaction. And in one go, we can see that the root of the regression was in our dependency, and that will allow us to investigate it further. Now here we're relying on context and correlation, not in experience to debug a particular system. And this is something that I occasionally do at Skyscanner. I may use one of our uh, all observability platform and then try to find these uh, correlations and try to find the root cause for regressions. And not often, but sometimes I have found that I get to the same to the same uh, to the same investigation as service owners without having a clue of how the system operates. And sometimes I even may bring some information to the table that service owners may not have because they were not using uh, the same um, correlation or some of the open telemetry signals. Now, effective observability means uh, requires a few things. As we've seen, it requires that high granularity of the, the detailed telemetry from within operations that are happening in individual transactions through a distributed system. And we need context that ties that all together, all the signals and all the services as part of a holistic view. So that needs a couple of things. It needs that signal correlation so we can get metrics, traces and logs as part of the same context. And we need service correlation so we can identify these dependencies between services and see how one changes in one serv service may affect another. Now, for this to work, we need open standards. We cannot refer to, for example, the trace ID, or we cannot refer to a service ID or a service name in a particular way, depend in each organization, because it's not effective from the point of view of, um, it's not efficient from the point of view of, um, of integrating with open source tooling and with observability vendors.
So we need those open standards to be able to provide telemetry out of the box and for vendors to support these semantics. Now we've seen why observability matters and how does open telemetry help? Well, open telemetry's mission statement is to enable that effective observability that we've seen by making high quality portable telemetry ubiquitous. And it does that in a way that it puts the responsibility of instrumenting a service or instrumenting a, a particular library in the hands of the person that knows the most about it, which could be the library author or the, or the service or the service owner, without being tied to any implementation details. Now let me explain that in a bit more detail. And I'll go down to the to the some dis, API design of open telemetry now for a bit, and then we'll go back to some of the more high level um, some of the more high level um, concepts. Now this is what the an application instrumented with open telemetry looks like. We've got a clear distinction between what are called cross cutting packages and self contained packages. So the Open Telemetry API, for example, um, provides public interfaces and just a minimal implementation for the different telemetry signals. We've got metrics, we've got tracing, we've got baggage, and we've got login. So for each of these signals, it provides a pretty much a normally a no-op implementation of them. And it also provides context that allows to these signals to all be part of the same, as we've seen, the same context that ties them together. Now, application owners or whoever instruments a particular library or a service, they can rely on these APIs without being tied to any implementation. And this allows them to take long-term dependencies. And Open Telemetry provides very strong stability guarantees and APIs that are always going to be backward compatible. So service owners can rely on them. And then when they configure, the Open Telemetry SDK, they can decide how they want their metrics or the login or the tracing to be collected and to be exported from within a, a particular application. Now, these Open Telemetry SDKs for the for all the signals can also be extended by using plugins. And these plugins allow us to integrate with different open source tooling, for example, or other observability platforms to be able to, for example, export data in a particular format. And all that can be configured in one and only one place. So for example, if you want to change the telemetry backend from Prometheus to a different one, we can do that without affecting how our applications are instrumented, without having to change any application code, only where we configure the Open Telemetry SDK. Now, these contract packages that are open source packages <clears throat> also provide what are called instrumentation packages. And these provide that out of the box telemetry out of like hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of different open source libraries and different languages. And, um, and for us, it's quite important because this is one of the, one of the areas where we want to remove the responsibility from service owners to having to instrument their services. So relying on these instrumentation packages means that we can reduce one, the toil that it takes to instrument services and also to maintain it. Because as libraries evolve, the instrumentation has to evolve with them. So relying on these packages allows us to, to offload that to, to telemetry experts that, that instrumented those, um, those libraries. And last but not least is the semantic conventions that you see there. Semantic conventions allow us to decorate telemetry with properties and attributes that follow um, some common naming. So I think we've always been we've we've all been there and trying to say how do we define, for example, what then how we say the AWS region or the or the cloud region for a particular um, metric. Um, before we started to use Open Telemetry at Skyscanner, we had multiple ways of doing this. Could be cloud.region, could be AWS.region, it could even be data center because some metrics were before we migrated to the cloud. And um, and now with Open Telemetry, we've got one way of doing that, and it comes as a package that we can use across our applications. 
Now, the good news about this is that it's also supported by open source tooling and observability vendors to provide out-of-the-box uh, correlation and out-of-the-box analysis from within these signals. And that's what influenced as well our buy versus build decision on Skyscanner. So when we think about a um, vendor and what the value that vendors provided before open telemetry most of them relied on their own instrumentation agents and their own apis and protocols and this is something that we were not very keen on a sky scanner to basically lock ourselves to a particular vendor in the at that layer at the instrumentation and export and transport layer because it meant that we couldn't move between let's say open source solutions and it also meant that we were in a way limited by whatever that vendor integrated it integrated it with from the point of view of open source uh, libraries that they that they worked with now with open telemetry things changed dramatically because now we could we can use open source for our instrumentation we can use open standards and open um, uh, standard protocols for the export and transport of telemetry data and then we can rely on on vendors for the parts that where they actually deliver value which is the storage and querying that analysis and correlation between uh, telemetry signals using the same semantic conventions and then of course the dashboards and, and alerts that that, um, that that were on top of that so now that we've seen how open telemetry and open standards can help, let's, uh, let's go through how you can roll open telemetry efficiently within your organization. And this is one of the principles, guiding principles for platform engineering at Skyscanner. And this is to make the golden path the path of least resistance. So when we're thinking about rolling out an observability strategy, there are certain things that we need to decide. For example, um, what format are we going to be um, collecting metrics or, or exporting metrics and what is the aggregation level? What are the aggregation intervals? Things like that. There are basically some standards that we would like to be adopted across the company. Now, one way of doing that would be to basically have those in a list and then allowing and then basically requiring service owners to implement it themselves. In another way, which is the one that we take, is to be to give service owners an easy way of applying these best practices. And the way that we do that is using internal libraries that every single service a Skyscanner uses. Now, these libraries, um, they configure multiple things, not just telemetry. They do security, networking, plenty of other things. So within these libraries, we can configure how we want the open telemetry SDK that we saw before to 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 uh, collect and to export telemetry data and um, and this basically allows us to execute our observability strategy with minimal friction for service owners now let me take you on a journey of simplification as sky scanner and this is the I'm not this is a horrible slide and I'm not planning to um, explain every single component that is here in this slide and I don't expect you to to read through it but it shows the complexity of uh, this what it shows is the complexity of the telemetry pipelines and the telemetry tooling at Skyscanner before we started to rely on open standards and before we started to rely on open telemetry now it is a very it was a very complex system but the worst part of it is that it was not a very usable one. We had one vendor for um, synthetics, one vendor for for browser age, for um, ROM metrics. We had another vendor for tracing, and then a bunch of open source tooling internally and and telemetry backends. And each one of them would basically be isolated. So. Service owners would just have to go to one place for logs and another place or two other places for metrics. And it just didn't really provide definitely that effective observability that we needed. And as well as I mentioned, the semantic conventions were completely 
uh, domain specific, completely uh, custom made to Skyscanner. Now, when we started our journey, we integrated with, um, sometimes we had to integrate with, with vendor provided software, but in a way that we didn't rely, we didn't, our service never depended on the particular service and uh, software, but we were still using, still trying to aim for those uh, semantic, uh, for those open, uh, open standards and semantic conventions. So when we started to use open telemetry, um, we started to simplify our backend using other open standards to to also integrate with 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 these vendors. And by the way, I've removed the names of vendors because I'm not trying to advertise anything. And um, and now this is where we are at the moment, where our applications depend on the Open Telemetry API. Our backend applications depend on the Open Telemetry API, and we use Open Telemetry Collector. Um, in agent mode to be able to extract information from our infrastructure and from our Kubernetes clusters. And then we feed that information through open telemetry collectors as a gateway to integrate with our third party vendor. Now this is not the end state for us. We believe that the future will rely more on open telemetry and it will be even more simple from the point of view of instrumentation. So we see that any browser side, mobile side, or backends will depend on the Open Telemetry API in different um, in different ways, and we'll start to rely on Open Telemetry collectors for anything that is related to collecting information from infrastructure, and then all fed through Open Telemetry an Open Telemetry collector gateway that allows us to control how we integrate with a vendor and is the last hop of telemetry. Now this is important as well because feeding all that through collectors allows us to control that last hop of telemetry and make better use of um, resources or networking and also be able to control things like authentication or if we want to transform telemetry in a particular way, we can do it. Even when we integrate with cloud provider um, endpoints, we, we want to rely on open telemetry protocols and open standards to be able to integrate with other vendors. So you can see the simplification that one can achieve by using open telemetry and the instrumentation and export layer and the transport and processing while relying on vendors for the storage querying and, and the UI and alerts. Another area where we capitalized on the use of open standards was our migration from open tracing to open telemetry. Now, as you probably know, Open Telemetry is a merger between Open Tracing and Open Sensors, two projects that were popular um, before Open Telemetry and then now are deprecated. Now, at Skyscanner, we were big users of Open Tracing across all of our stack, and uh, an Open Tracing had a similar API designed to Open Telemetry. So, as I said. There is an open tracing API with no implementation. And then when the application starts up, we can get the, uh, we, we configure the implementation from that API. Now with open telemetry, as there is compatibility with those previous um, projects, we can use what's called the open telemetry or the open tracing shim from open telemetry. That basically acts as an implementation for open tracing. And then that relays calls to the API to the Open Telemetry API. So what that meant for us was that we could start to roll out Open Telemetry under the hood, while applications um, that were relying on Open Tracing could still rely on Open Tracing. And any instrumented middleware or instrumented HTTP or gRPC clients could still use Open Tracing, while service owners were gradually being moved to rely natively on Open Telemetry, which is our current state. But that meant that we could start to produce data with um, open telemetry protocols and could start to propagate trace context with open telemetry formats. So what did that mean? Well, as I said, we roll out um, changes at Skyscanner as part of our internal libraries. And it does pay off when you work in platform engineering. And um, what you see here is our adoption of open telemetry within Skyscanner and how many services were sending telemetry to those open telemetry collectors. So um, we went from an early adoption phase 
with um, 10 to 15 services. And then when we released our libraries publicly within Skyscanner, we saw that jump from, yeah, those 15 services to over 130 services in a matter of four or five days. So that is one hell of a curve of uh, tech adoption. We're quite happy about that. Now we've got um, hundreds and hundreds of services being instrumented natively with open telemetry. And as I said, we send all that all that data through collectors and they are incredibly powerful. We receive data in multiple formats, OTLP being the major one, but we also do some Zipkin and Prometheus. And open telemetry collectors can receive that data and then work with it in some way using processors. So they can remove unwanted attributes, they can rename attributes, they can change span status if we need them. We can even generate metrics from spans. And that allowed us to upgrade Istio without relying on Mixer, but just getting the Zipkin, the um, the spans from, M from Envoy in Zipkin format and generating the metrics from it. And we explore that data in OTLP and as well Prometheus for internal usage. So they are incredibly efficient as well. We generate more than 1.8 million spans per second. That's across um, 90,000 spans, um, 90,000 traces per second. And they do all this with less than 125 cores being used across all of our clusters and with less than 100 replicas in total. So incredibly little useful um, tooling here. Now that we've seen how we can roll out open telemetry, I'd like to take you through some steps that you can take to to basically make sure that you, you can keep telemetry valuable within your organization. Because the reality is that most data that we gather for debugging purposes is never used. Um, when we th Before open telemetry, when we had basically were using metrics and logs uh, most of the time, um, we found that basically all the logs that were being, well, the, the logs that are being stored, they normally correspond to requests that are successful in a way. They, they, don't, um, they return in an acceptable response time or an expected response time, and they don't contain any errors. But we still had to keep those logs. And uh, same with metrics, we found that metrics that were being generated with some really high granularity attributes because service owners were not using tracing to debug and they were using metrics to debug regressions. Now we've seen how open telemetry can help you use the right tool for the right job. So when you've got metrics that are low cardinality and low volume, but they can link to traces and those distributed traces can be sampled in a much better way than you could sample login. Let's consider this case, for example, we've got on the left a trace, um, a distributed trace that goes through multiple services. So if you were to sample logs, you can only sample logs by looking at an individual log record, right? So you can decide to maybe store 10% of the debug logs and maybe all 100% of the errors, right? But then those debug logs can be crucial to identify a regression. So then what ends up happening is that people store all the debug logs and then become quite costly from the point of view of storage and transport. So with distributed tracing, we have better ways of being able to keep the useful data and then discard the rest. On the example on the left, we're using what's called probability sampling. This means that when um, that we decide if we want to keep a span or not, we want to sample a span or not, depending on its properties or the propagated trace context that comes with it. So for example, here, service A starts a trace and decides to sample that particular trace, the whole trace, depending on the trace ID. So it decides to sample the span and then it propagates that decision downstream. So we've got the child span, for example, here that says, well, if my parent's span was sampled, then I respect that decision and I'll sample it myself. And when we propagate that to a 
another service that may be using a different type of sampling, that service can basically say, well, if this trace is already being sampled, then I will store all the spans for this particular um, for this particular trace. So what this allows us is to have one complete view of distributed transactions without having to keep every single one of them. Now, this is simpler to configure because it doesn't require any external components, but it does have one downside. That is that we're looking at the, a percentage of the traces being sampled. And we can't really identify which ones are the good ones or the bad ones. So with tail-based sampling, on the other hand, we can have a look at the whole trace. It is more powerful, but it also requires external components. It requires all the spans for one particular trace to be fed through the same uh, replica, so it can be fed through the same, um, so it can be kept in memory. So the way it works is um, when you receive the first span for a trace, you start storing all the spans for that particular trace in memory, and then you wait for some time. So that can be configured in multiple ways. Uh, but then at some point, you need to make a decision if you want to keep this trace or not. But you can look at the whole trace and you can see, well, is this trace slower than usual, slower than normal, so then we'll keep it. Or does this trace contain any errors in any of the individual operations, then we'll keep it. So then allows for a more um, insightful way of, um, of keeping data, of sampling data. But it does require, as I said, an external component. Normally that could be an open telemetry collector where you can save all the data. And there are different ways where you can route traces to particular collectors. Or you can use a vendor, and there are multiple vendors out there that provide this capability to do tail-based uh, sampling. Now, you, this uh, Skyscanner allows us to store about f only 4.5% of all our traces. And what we do here is we're storing the ones that matter, the ones that are like slower than usual, or the ones that are uh, that contain errors, and then we store a percentage, a random percentage of the of the rest. But you can see how we're just keeping the valuable data and reducing costs these way uh, and in these ways. Now, when service owners come to instrument their services they can sometimes add a lot of cost and a lot of uh, load to telemetry systems. And as platform engineers, we've got two ways to deal with this, two main ways. One is the way of uh, limiting. So we can have controls on how service owners are allowed to add telemetry to their systems. For example, to add an instrumentation package or to um, add a new custom metric they create a request and then basically they can, um, another team goes and puts that into an allowed list and then you end up being able to do that. But it generally doesn't work. Um, slows down team velocity because they'll be blocked on another team to allow them to produce telemetry. It generates toil for telemetry admins as well to add that, that exception to our rule. And then it generally falls out of date soon. So there could be a metric that you instrumented last year that was crucial for your service. But now the service evolved and it's no longer valuable, but still there um, incurring costs. Now what's, um, what works better is to visualize, to put data in front of people and to visualize that cost um, or that load in the system, in the telemetry backends and systems, and encouraging a good use of telemetry signals. So here, open telemetry can also help because it allows us to segment data using semantic conventions. So we've seen how every single event or log or um, metric span, it could be, uh, it has to be annotated with uh, the service name, for example. And optionally, the service namespace, which is a way to group multiple services together. And then we can assign that, we can split that data and look at, look at for example, storage cost or storage volume or, or cardinality for each of the services. And then we can assign uh, cost to teams. And when teams start to review this, when they review the telemetry cost, 
close to their to other costs, like for example, um, cloud provider costs, they start to be proactive about this. And we've seen that um, internally. We've seen teams that that they start to look at telemetry in a way that well, are we actually using the right signal um, to instrument our services? And in some cases, we've seen teams that just by moving away from debug level logging and into tracing, they have saved more than 90% of uh, telemetry costs. So we're rewarding that learning of learning to use the right signal, the right tool for the right job. And we're also making sure that uh, the telemetry that we're using is the best that we can. And that also enables product health. Another area where we can learn from our um, failures is during the incident response, or during the incident, uh, the incident post-mortem and discussing those learnings. This is one of my favorite quotes from Einstein, that is, failure is success in progress. And we should all be familiar here with, um, with the learnings that one can get from post-mortems, of sharing those across the organization and sometimes outside the organization. And we're normally focused on learning from it from the point of view of um, improving the resiliency of the systems, improving the reliability, but not always from the point of view of um, improving the observability of our systems, especially when we think about the system as a whole. So we can, we can foster that learning and improvement culture by following some steps. So one is, the first one is to establish those targets for uh, time to detection and time to resolve. And it's quite important because when those are not met, we can start to find areas of improvement. I, that could be looking at new telemetry that we could add, new instrumentation packages. We could, um, we could, we could make sure that service owners are using the right tool to debug their services. Maybe their dashboards and their or maybe their RAM books did not even mention looking at distributed traces, for example. So this is where we can, where it's good to encourage certain observability champions within your organization to join these postmortems and to provide their feedback and to say, well, actually, did you know that? Maybe you didn't know, but you've got tracing enabled by default. And we've seen this happening where service owners did not know that, you know, or they were not making, or they knew that there was tracing, but they didn't know how to use it. So having these observability champions helps to bring that to attention. But also having a guild or a chapter or some form of like group of people across a company, across an organization, where you can not just gather external feedback, but also share learnings, share these postmortems, share news about observability, new features, and so on. And the last thing, and I think it's quite valuable and something that is sometimes overlooked, is how telemetry and how observability can just help teams understand their systems outside of the life of the incident life cycle. So we've seen that when you get two teams in one room that are part of the same system and that and that their traces will be going through multiple to so some of their services. What we've seen is that that allows them to identify usage patterns they may not know that were there, for example, a particular dependency or a particular endpoint that's being used that didn't know it was being used. So being able to have those sessions where teams can evaluate that telemetry together and can improve, one, the telemetry that they produce, and also the system in some way is, is quite important. So a few takeaway messages from, from this talk. The first one is, um, that complex systems require effective observability. We can no longer just pretend that we can debug in our systems looking at individual services and looking at uh, signals, telemetry signals, as isolated events. We've seen as well how open standards and open telemetry can empower organizations to, to simplify their infrastructure, to simplify their their tooling, their telemetry tooling, while integrating with, with vendors and with other open source um, platforms as well. And also how open telemetry enables signals to be used efficiently. So when we use the right signal or the right tool for the right job, not, we're not just improving observability, but we may, all be, we may also be reducing costs 
and reducing the operational toil and the cognitive load to operate our services. Thank you.